Thank you, team. Now, please leave your Bible open at uh, Romans chapter 12. Uh, we are going to consider especially verses 1 to 8. Before we do so, let us ask the Lord's help for the preaching of His Word. Let us pray. O oh Lord, our God, we pray that you may be pleased to speak to us and that you may move us to have an attitude of total consecration to you, that we may want to serve you. Help us, O oh God, to concentrate, to listen to your word preached as we are tempted to a disruption in, an, in a more informal setting. Lord, help us. Give us the spirit of self-control and discipline, that we may discipline our mind to listen to your word explained and applied to us. Help us, O God. Fill us with one spirit, speaker, and listeners. Unite us in Christ. In his name we pray. Amen. So please leave your Bible open at Romans chapter 12. And this morning the Lord help us to uh, consider this passage. Let me read to you Romans chapter 12 verses 1 to 2 again. Paul says here to the Christian believers, the church members in Rome, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Well, can you remember so many weeks ago, we look at the ascension of Christ. And last Lord's Day morning, we were so happy we could gather together and fellowship and worship. We look at how the enthroned Christ gave gifts to the church at his ascension. In Ephesians chapter 4, when he ascended on high, he led, he led captivity captive and gave gifts to man. In Ephesians 4, Paul tells us especially some of the gifts the ascended and enthroned Christ gave to his church. And they are apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. These five different offices. And you'll notice uh, these were all ministers of the word. Apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors and teachers, they are all ministers of the word. They all occupied a specific office in the church. And they were all engaged in the ministry of the word. We mentioned the ministry of the word, they are the foundation of the church. They are of first importance, but they are not an end to itself. The church is not about pastors and teachers or apostles and prophets. No, 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 no. Ministers of the word are to minister in the word. What for? We are told in Ephesians 4, if you are quick, you can turn to that passage, for the equipping of the saints. They are to teach God's word so as to equip all Christians believers so that all the saints may serve. Ministers, pastors, teachers, evangelists, they are to equip the saints so that they can serve, so that the whole Christian church may grow to maturity, to the full stature in Christ, that God's people may have discernment and stability. Well, I mentioned 
Last week, that there are actually four lists of spiritual gifts in the New Testament, Ephesians 4, and the rest, do you still remember? Think, or you can talk to each other at home. Yes, uh, 1 Peter chapter 4, 7 11. Okay, you can remember 7 11 and 1 Peter 4 and 1 Corinthians 12. And then the passage this morning, Romans chapter 12. This morning we're focusing on Romans chapter 12. Now let us look at verses 1 and 2 first. Or I should say verse 1. Uh, but actually it's both verses. Paul says, I beseech you therefore. Don't ever miss a therefore in Paul's letters. They're important, the therefore. Paul says, because of the mercies of God shown you, you are to present your bodies as a living sacrifice. The mercies of God which Paul talks about here are the previous 11 chapters. And in those chapters, Paul especially talks about justification by faith, that we are saved, we are justified by the free grace of God through faith in Christ. So the first uh, 11 chapters are theological. They're the foundation. And then chapters 13 to 15 are the practical applications of the doctrines in the first 11 chapters. It is always in that order. I mean the truth of the Bible. First of all, we have the foundation and then we build our lives upon that. It's always theological and then practical. And let us remember what is the foundation and what is to be built upon it. So let me uh, revise. Chapters 1 to 11 of Romans are the teaching, the foundation, the theological chapters. Chapters 12 to 15 are the practical chapters, the application, so to say. Now some of you are smart to say, how about chapter 16? Chapter 16 is a long chapter of greetings. Paul actually knows a lot of the church members in Rome and he greets them one by one. Now, look at verse 1 again. I don't know whether you're able to see the outline. Uh, oh yes, you're able. That's good. Thanks, Stephen. Uh, look at it. Again, verse 1, Paul says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. How practical this is. Paul asked Christian believers, because of the mercies of God, because you are justified by faith in Christ, because of God's free grace in Christ, you are to present your whole bodies as a living sacrifice to God. Your whole bodies. Remember Andy Fennison? Take my hands, take my feet, take my lips, take my voice, everything. We are to have total consecration to God through Christ. Do you still remember the first question in the Heidelberg Catechism? How does it go? It asks us what is your only comfort in life and in death? And the answer is, of a Christian believer, that I am not my own, but belong body and soul, in life and in death, to my faithful Saviour, Jesus Christ. We tend only to know the first questions in the Catechism, isn't it? We know the first question in the Sorda Catechism. We know the first question in the Heidelberg Catechism. And we do not know so much about the rest 
or this uh, precious catechism. But still, questions one, Westminster Shorty Catechism, and question one, Heidelberg Catechism, they are so precious. Our comfort is that we are not our own. Our supreme comfort in life and in death is that we are not our own, but we belong to Christ. Body and soul, in life and in death. You got your Bible open? Turn to Romans chapter 14, verses 7 to 8. Can you find it? Romans chapter 14, verses 7 to 8. Paul speaking to the Christians in Rome again. He says, For none of us lives to himself, and no one dies to himself. For if we live, we live to the Lord, and if we die, we die to the Lord. Therefore, whether we live or die, we are the Lord. You hear that? No single Christian lives to himself or herself. If we live, we live to the Lord. If we die, we die to the Lord. So whether we live or whether we die, we belong to the Lord. Total consecration. Think of it, as Paul says here, it's a sacrifice. In the Old Testament, when an animal is sacrificed, sacrificed, when an animal is burned up, well, the animal is gone. But when we offer ourselves to God, we are living sacrifice. We are not burned up to death. We go on to live, and we are meant to be living sacrifices to God. Total consecration, living sacrifice. And that reminds me of this book. I don't know whether you can... And can people see this book? Yes, you can. It's called Living Sacrifice by Helen Rosevere. Let me tell you her story. Helen Rosevere was a medical missionary from England to Sayil in 1953 to 1973. Well, she was a graduate of Cambridge University. She got her medical degree there, a prestigious degree in medicine from a well-known university. And she gave up all, including the prospect of marriage, to become a pioneer medical missionary in modern-day Congo. She was the first of such medical missionary in that vast area. And she thought, well, my consecration to the Lord is total. I'm a living sacrifice. I've sacrificed everything to the Lord. Well, what happened is, she got there, stayed there for some time, and the Holy Spirit breathed upon the African people and the missionaries as well. Revival came. Many, many people were under conviction of sins. They cried out to God for mercy. It was a mighty work of the Holy Spirit. And because she was white, she was a missionary, she was assigned to be counselor to these African Christians who were in distress, and they would like to confess their sins to her, asking her for spiritual counsel and advice. And guess what? She was not happy at all. She would not enter into that revival. Why? Because she didn't want to hear the confession of the sins of these African Christians, these women. She thought her mind would get polluted by their confession of sins. Remember her background? 1953, single woman, single woman from England. She thought herself to be so pure. I don't want to get my mind polluted all this, all, with all these stories of their terrible wickedness and sins. So she was listening to their uh, confessions 
but she would be cold and detached. She said, I will not be involved emotionally at all. She refused the work of the Holy Spirit until one day she heard, as it were, the Lord Jesus said to her, Helen, I was made sin for you that you may become righteousness in me. And now you're holding back yourself. You're not willing to be burdened and troubled by the sins of my people. She felt so convicted. She learned afresh what is total consecration. We are seeing verse 1. Long way to go. Now we've make our speed faster. Look at verse 2. Paul talks about the continual renewing of the mind. He says, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Do not be conformed to this world. Do not be like this world, but be transformed in your mind by continuing renew of your mind. Now, you have to believe me, but Tim will say what I said is true. The tenses here are the present tense in Greek. What it means is that it is a, something continuous, continuous. Go on, keep on not conforming to the will. And go on, keep on, be transformed in your mind. Oh dear friend, what we need is to have our mind constantly transformed by the word of God that we may, that our thinking may be conformed to the truth of God, the word of God. Let me remind you again of the primacy and the importance of the mind in the Christian religion. Christianity is different to all the other religions in the world. The mind is so important in the Christian faith. What we think, how we think, our foundational importance. Remember that word, foundation, again. Because the nature of Christianity is about truth, fact, the truth about God, the truth about us, the fact about the person of Jesus, what he has done, his death for sinners, the fact of his resurrection, and so on. So, Christian faith is about the truth, informing the mind, moving the will, the will to obedience, and stirring up the emotions of joy and sorrow. You may remember, as I've told you before, many times, the word repent in Greek means, first of all, change your mind. Interestingly enough, the Hebrew word for repentance uh, is turn. Adding both of them together, it change our mind first, and then we may turn from sin and turn to God. Now let us follow that sequence again. It's thinking, changing our will, moving our will to action. Now, if I may mention, my friend at this stage, Helen was severe, living sacrifice again. Let me give you an example of how her mind was changed by the Word of God and the dealings of the Holy Spirit. I really love this book. I really love it. I should have read it 40 years ago or more. I got one dollar from Kruo in those days. I never read it until now. I'll tell you why this book is so good. It is such an honest sharing by Helen Roosevelt of her feelings, her struggles, her failures. It's so helpful. It is so Devastatingly honest. 
Now, one more example from Helen Roosevelt. I would say she was such a superwoman because she went to that part of Congo as the pioneer missionary. She was the only doctor there, the only doctor there, and she single-handedly established a 100-bed hospital. Think of that. Now, some of you people there who are watching, you are medical people, can one doctor look after a hospital of 100 bed? She did. People from a radius of 300 kilometers were coming to her. Wow! So many people. She actually built her own hospital. She learned how to bake, not bread, but bricks. She learned how to bake bricks and build a hospital. She learned to be a motor mechanics because there was no motor mechanics around. She really did everything. Other than looking after the sick and the dying, she has to train the native African people to become medical staff, midwives, nurses, doctors, down to mixing medicine. And she was certainly overworked and she grew bitter. She thought she was so much better than all the other missionaries. She thought she had sacrificed so much to the work of the Lord. But she felt people did not appreciate her. She gave into bitterness, to self-pity, to what she called pity little me syndrome. Self-pity. Until one day, people told her, honestly, Helen, we can see your hurt pride. We can see your pride. And she was so angry. She was so angry. Have I been proud? I've given up so much and you people don't appreciate what I'm doing. I'm the only doctor here. I work day and night. I work exhaustion. And then one of the missionaries told her, Helen, God's will for all of us, His ultimate will for all of us, is that we should be like Jesus, His Son. Helen, you need to die to self. Oh, yes. She needs to have her mind change constantly from hurt pride, from self-pity, to contentment, to happy service, to humility. Well, let us move on. Our first major heading is total consecration. The second major heading is humble self-estimation. Or assessment. Look at Romans chapter 12, verse 3. Paul says, For I say, through the grace given to me, to everyone who is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly, as God has dealt to each one a measure of faith. I guess we all have a tendency to think too highly of ourselves, especially when we are young. Well, I guess hardly any one of us can measure up to the capacity of work and intelligence and the physical energy of Helen Bosevi. She was really a super, super woman. We are not. And each one of us should have a humble self-estimation of himself or herself. Don't think of ourselves higher than we ought to think of ourselves. But then, don't be too humble in the sense that you say to yourself, 
I can't do anything. I'm not capable of anything. Yes, you are capable of something. We're all called to serve. So let's move on. The third major heading, which I call appropriate and joyful service. Let us go to Romans chapter 12, verses 4 to 5. For as we have many members in one body, but all the members do not have the same function, so we, being many, are one body in Christ, and individually members of one and other. Paul says to us, the attitude in our service is to see the church as one body in Christ. We belong to each other. We are one body. But then we are individually different members. Just as you look at your body, uh, we have many different body parts. The ear, the eyes, the mouth, the nose, the hands and the feet. And different members have different functions, different work to do. You don't want your nose to eat. No. Uh, we want our mouth to eat. We want our ear to hear. But the ear cannot see, and so on. So this should be our attitude in our cushion service. Individually, we are members, different members, and have a different gift, but belong to the same body of Christ. Now we come down to the manner of our service. It should be appropriate and joyful. It should be a willing service. We are to use our different gifts, our different individual gifts, to serve one another. Look at verse 6. Having them gifts different according to the grace that is given to us, let us use them. Stop there. We are given different gifts. My gift is not your gift. Your gift is not mine. But whatever gift we may have, whatever minors or talents we may have, they are all given to us. And we are to use them. Let us use them. I want to impress upon your mind so that you may be willing for action. Let us use them. Let us use our individual gift. And then interestingly, Paul goes on to list seven specific examples of gift. And I wanted to notice in the list of gift in Romans chapter 12, they are all about ministries, not offices, not titles, and that is in contrast to Ephesians 4. Ephesians 4, they all have to do with persons, offices, titles, apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. There are members of the church who have official positions, like elders, and ministers, and so on. Now that's Ephesians 4. But now in Romans chapter 12, the seven gifts given here, they all have to do with service, ministry, but no official titles or positions. And I want to say this to you friends. We don't need and official positions or titles to serve in the church. If anything, you notice in the New Testament church, there are very few official positions. The most prominent, permanently, 
instead of eldership, elders. But other than elders, well, there are very few officials' positions. Why? Because New Testament church life is organic instead of organizational. The New Testament church is not a corporation. It's a body. It's a body. So let us look at these seven specific examples of gift. And by the way, they are not exhaustive listed. Don't think that they have listed all the gifts in the New Testament. The first is prophecy. What is prophecy? Well, prophecy is to speak words inspired by the Holy Spirit that come directly from God. They are special revelation given directly from the Holy Spirit. Remember, Felix has four virgin daughters and they were prophetess. They were engaging in prophesying. How are people to use that sort of gift? If prophecy, let us prophesy in proportion to our faith. If one is given the gift of direct revelation from God, direct word from God, well, they must prophesy in proportion to what they are given, not beyond that. People should not claim prophecy when they are not given the direct revelation of God. Let us move on. We want to concentrate on the second one. In verse 7, our ministry, let us use it in our ministry. Well, if we translate that as service, we come closer to the sense and we won't misunderstand. Or service. Service. What does it mean? The word here means assistant and help by performing certain duties. Often of a humble, menial nature. That is service. A prime example would be like serving as waiter. You know, waitering is a very humble job because you just serve people, you serve people food, you take care of people. Well, that is that, service. Now, under service, can we think of a lot of things that we can do in the church? For example, some people are gifted with physical strength. They're very handy. They are gifted in laboring. Some people can lift up 20 kilos without any difficulties. Well, their gift is to serve the Lord in the church by physical labor. Handy work, being handyman, laboring. Other people are musical. Not everyone is musical, but some are. If you are musical, you can use your gift to serve the Lord in the church. But well, I get a bit personal this morning. How happy we are to see a newly married couple, husband and wife, playing the organ and the piano in our morning service. Every time I heard they're practicing together, I feel just so happy. Some people are artistic, especially in our time. A lot of material from the church, advertising material and things like that, we need some artistic skill. The design website and so on. We can think of technical skill, like computer skill. Well, I can say this to you, uh, without Stephen's help, we cannot have the service here this morning. So let us pray for St Stephen and praise him as well, thank him as well. We are so blessed to have uh, Stephen to serve us in so many ways, including uh, his technical computer skill. Some people are good at typing. I am hopeless in typing. I type one word, I have to revise it three times. Someone has to keep the account for the church. Imagine if there's no one to keep the financial account of the church, we'll be 
in this way. Some people are good at cooking. I know how to cook. It's instant noodle, cup noodle. But some of you can do better. Some are good at cleaning up. Some are good at washing up. So the idea here is mutual service. Serving one another. What a beautiful thing it is to see in a church when people are eager to serve. And I guess on the surface you can think of so many other things and instead of people just standing by doing nothing, well, let us serve one another. We'll move on to the third gift, teaching. In verse 7, he will teach us in teaching. Now the teaching here is not about the pastors and teachers having official titles, it's teaching in general. That includes teaching children, older women, teaching younger women. Even though we belong to a denomination that we do not ordain women to the ministry of the word, yet we wholeheartedly believe that many women are capable teachers. Teaching informally, teaching children, teaching other women. So that's teaching. And some of you are gifted to teach. Exhortation. In verse 8, the fourth example of gift. He will exhort in exhortation. Now, what is this all about? Exhortation is primarily about encouragement. Life in the first century was generally fairly grim, said the Australian commentator Leo Morris in days gone by. But life in the 21st century is very demanding and challenging. We got material abundance in Australia. Yes, we got that. But there are many people who are distressed, who are in need of comfort and encouragement. Are you gifted to encourage another person? Why don't you try to talk to someone before church and after church when I prepared this sermon, I did not expect that we could not meet physically. So I was going to encourage everyone to try to talk with someone whom you have not been talking for some time. But then we cannot meet today. So remember this, my reminder to you this morning, the next time we can come together, why don't you pick up someone whom you have never talked to or whom you have not talked to for some time and try to get to know that person you may find some distressed souls people who are in need of, en of encouragement well we usually leave to the minister to greet the people at the end of the service but you realize the minister cannot do it all I remember serving as a student minister in a big congregation here in Sydney. Uh, and that congregation got hundreds of people. Uh, the minister I was working under in those days, he got what you call a dictaphone. He would stand at the door, he would greet the people, and then he would put down on his dictaphone uh, the names of the people, their needs and so on. And then on Monday morning he would have have a pastoral team group of mainly ladies going through the list and trying to assign different tasks of help given to them. Uh, the minister before him got a most wonderful memory. He did not need that sort of uh, technology. He could just remember anything, everything. But dear friends, think of that. In that congregation of a few hundred people, is it right to leave it to the minister alone to do the word of exhortation and encouragement? 
we should all be doing that in some way. Can we not share with someone our experience of the Lord's goodness and mercy? Share your testimony. Share what you have read in the Bible, some Bible verses. Pray for another person, pray together. Share a book reading. Exhortation means encouragement. I want all of us to think, can I not encourage someone? The fifth gift, in verse 8, he will give with liberality. And the gift here is very simple, very direct, is giving money. Some of us are more well placed than others to give money. Think of a single income family with 10 kids living in Africa. That family will be far less able to give than a double income family with no kids in Australia. For those of us who are gifted with finances, we can give. That may be the simplest way of service, isn't it? But that is still necessary. It's so simple. It's so easy. Okay, the sixth gift. In verse 8, He who leads with diligence. The leading here is that of leadership. Leadership that serves in order to benefit others. It's an interesting, the, lead, the leading here doesn't even have a title or an office. It's the gift of leading. Those who are gifted to lead, they should do so with diligence, eagerness, earnestness, putting one's whole self into the effort, working with zeal and energy. Those who are gifted in leading, if they do not do so conscientiously and diligently, no one will take them to task. But then, the church will suffer. Leaders must take initiative. And it's an interesting again. The leading is not left only to those who have official titles. It's a gift. Now lastly, in verse 8, he who shows mercy with cheerfulness. What is this about? This is about helping those in need. It's ministry to people in need that is direct and personal. Caring for the sick and elderly. I remember Someone told me of another church, of a young man. I think he was only a teenager in those days. He spontaneously would help the older people walking out of the church. No one told him to do that. He just did it, spontaneously. Well, that is showing mercy. Helping the poor and disabled, the suffering. Those who are in, in emotional distress or financial need. In the early church, the aliens, the orphans, and the widows. Those who are dying, who have lost a loved one, bearing the dead. In my home church, there used to be, I don't know where they still got it, they got a special worker, pay worker, I must say, to help arranging funeral uh, with church members. In Hong Kong, uh, arranging funeral is more complicated than in Australia. And I remember when my father died, this lady worker, who actually got a master in the pastoral counseling and so on, uh, she accompanied myself and my mother, going through everything, uh, from choosing 
the coffin, choosing which company we should go by. Uh, she knew all the technical details about arranging funeral because that was her uh, specialty, so on uh, and so forth. And I, I felt so comfortable. Well, but friends, uh, we do not need a pay worker, someone who may be gifted in showing mercy. I got it here, helping those who are in prison. In the first century, there are a number of Christians who are in prison. Remember, Paul was helped while in prison. So he shows mercy with cheerfulness. Now as we conclude, let me say this. Not everyone can do all these things well. Those who are good at laboring, at repairing stuff, they may not be very gifted in giving money or showing mercy or encouragement. Those who are able to show mercy may not be very good at fixing things. Those who are able to give money may not be good at technology. Let each one of us discern what gift we have and use it as we can appropriately and joyfully. But before I finish, let me encourage you. Try to serve and you'll discover what gift you may have. Some of you have heard of Gerald Bridges, of a navigator. He wrote a number of books, I think about four to five, not more than that perhaps. Uh, you know what? He discovered he got the gift of writing at the age of about 60. Late in life, he discovered that he could write, and he wrote a few books. And at least in my days, those books were very helpful. So try to serve, discover your gift, and you'll be up to some pleasant surprises and untold blessings. If we put ourselves out to serve, we are the person to be blessed. Remember what our Lord Jesus says, it's more blessed to give than to serve. Shall we pray? O oh Lord our God, we thank you for the fellowship in our church here. You have given to each one of us some gift, some talent. Move us to be willing to serve. O oh Lord God, I am so thankful to you for the help my brothers have given me this morning, for Tim, for Stephen. And Lord, I pray that you may be with us all. Move us, that we may not be lazy believers, lay about, but Lord, help each one of us to discover our own gift. We pray for your protection for those who are serving us in such a time at the risk of their own lives, especially the medical personnel those who are involved in transportation, those who serve in retail, those who serve in takeaway shops, O oh Lord, be gracious to them. And we look forward to that day when we shall meet together face to face and do help us to talk to each other, to minister to one another, to encourage one another. All oh, help us, Lord. Advance your kingdom, even in such a time. We do remember there are many, many Christian believers who can't even meet as we are doing here. Those 
believers in India, in Myanmar, in North Korea, O oh Lord, have mercy upon them. Have mercy upon this world. All for Jesus' sake. Amen.